Hi, everybody. Good evening. Um, I'm Erin Hussein, and I'm the Associate Director of Alumni Relations for GSAS. Um, and as GSAS alumni, you are part of an alumni group of over 46,000 GSAS alums around the world. Um, I am so glad to be connecting with all of you in this, this uh, virtual format this evening. Um, welcome to episode nine of GSAS Conversations in virtual form. Uh, through GS Conversations, we have traveled with GSAS alumni to Wall Street, Medieval Europe, the press room of the White House, urban centers, the new JFK Terminal One, the Vineyards of Italy, the World Series of Poker, and most recently to schools impacted by COVID in India and the Middle East. Today, I welcome Kobe, Kobe Abayomi. Dr. Abayomi earned the PhD in statistics in 2008, and he very recently joined the Warner Music Group where he is Senior Vice President for Data Science and Analytics. Um, and with, um, uh, you'll be muted throughout the presentation, um, but you can ask questions during the chat function. We also have a number of questions that came in during the registration process, and we will ask as many questions um, as we are able to. Um, so with, um, with that, I introduce uh, Dr. Abayomi. Thank you. Thanks, Aaron. Uh, I'm glad to virtually be back on Columbia's campus and uh, in service of the alma mater. Um, Looking forward to having a nice conversation. Uh, we'll have, you know, I have my slides and presentation to go through and, you know, go through that, but I'm looking forward to answering questions uh, and speaking <coughs> more, uh, with more verbosity um, uh, in the Q&A section. Um, so looking forward to get started. So we can start off with the uh, presentation if you're ready. <laughs> There we go. Okay. Great, thank you. So that's me, Kobe Abayomi. I um I just started uh, at, at Warner Music. Before that, I was at uh, Warner Media. I've spent uh, uh, about six or seven years of my career. Um, doing applied work on the corporate side. And before that, uh, I was a professor of statistics at uh, Georgia Tech and uh, Binghamton University. Um, I want to talk a little bit about sort of the measurement uh, behind inequality, give a couple sort of observational examples. And then at the end of it, we can sort of have a free form sort of discussion. Um, and, 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 and it'll be interesting to see where the conversation goes. Okay, so next slide. So first, starting off with, with just basically some sort of fundamental sort of notions behind inequality. You know, as a statistician, you know, we approach things uh, from their, our ability to, to measure them. I, uh, I still teach uh, statistics to, to undergrads and graduate students. And I'm always reinforcing that statistics is the science of experimentation. There's an underlying experiment, right? And from this underlying experiment, we get data. What's the underlying experiment uh, or, or notion behind uh, a, a concept as broad as sort of inequality, which, you know, is, is in the popular zeitgeist. Um, I, I remember being uh, in New York in the early 2000s and the Occupy Wall Street movement and people um, taking over the Cotty Park uh, in, the, in the aughts. Uh, and, and so, you know, this notion has, has circulated uh, through the, the public discourse. And I, I just want to start off with some of the uh, antecedents of it. And... Um, some definitional perspective on what inequality is. So if you'll just go forward again and then again. Just one more time, yep. Okay, so I love this quote from Bertrand Russell, one of my favorite um, mathematicians slash philosophers. And you'll find a lot of, the, most many of the people in the talk are sort of uh, contemporaneous, late uh, 1800s to middle uh, 20th century. Uh, knew each other, wrote to each other, spoke of each other. Uh, it was a very fertile time for statistics, which is, relatively late to the uh, mathematical sciences and uh, for, for people concerned about uh, social policy and measurement. So I love this quote from Russell. If there were any, if there were in the world today, any large number of people who desire their own happiness more than they have desired the unhappiness of others, we could have paradise in a few years. So it, this is an aspirational uh, uh, expectation for humanity, right? But underneath it, there's this notion that sort of we're all in it together 
Uh, and, and one of the sort of difficulties is the perspective we take on that sort of togetherness. And so that's one of the themes that I like to come back to when we start talking about inequality. Can we go to the next slide? Or just hit the arrow? And one, and one more time. So as we're discussing it, you, there are some things uh, that are sort of axiomatic that just are sort of offered as principles or ways that it, uh, so the points of departure, if you will. And the next arrow, dependence, uh, this notion of dependence that uh, the underlying sort of population in which we sort of talk about or measure inequality uh, has an interdependence, the notion of scarcity that sort of runs as a current through in any sort of economic uh, conversation. Uh, one more time. Uh, <clears throat> the notion of measurement, how we measure something and versus how it may be obfuscated. And then once more, um, <clears throat> I offer at the end of this talk, some illustration of a measurement of equality from an observational perspective. And there's always a difference between noticing some things are coincident and being able to say one thing predicts another, but that's part of the art of, of being able to understand and measure things. All right. Oh, and then please to the next slide. All right. So a good place to depart uh, and, and begin talking about the measurement of inequality uh, is, is with Rawls' theory of justice, sort of a more modern uh, take on uh, welfare economics. And welfare economics is sort of the study populations in general uh, and ways to sort of apportion resources. And when we talk about inequality, we often we're down to sort of a microeconomic sort of conversation, right? We talk about income equality, most of the time wealth inequality. Those are the popular sort of things uh, to discuss. <laughs> but the notion of, 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 of the, the entire society's welfare and its association with uh, the distribution of goods and resources are, are very closely linked with our ability to sort of measure it individually and, 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 and then speak about inequality for a population and how each of us feel it. If you go to the next slide. So this principle of justice, I think it's a great way to, to, to start off talking about inequality. Well, as, as an axiom, what's the best way to organize a society or to apportion uh, goods, consumption, income, wealth in a fair way? Um, and then Rawls has a, has, a, has, a, has, a, has a nuanced argument. Fairness can't just be instantaneous, right? Like I can't just say at this point, history has begun and everybody has the same income. Um, when we're talking about inequality, we know, and this is in the zeitgeist and reported on in the New York Times or, or whatever you can pick up these days, that there's a difference between wealth and, and, and income inequality, right? And, and, and equality in one does not subsume or create equality in the other. Um, and so Rawls had this notion of being able to supersede accidents of natural, of, of natural endowment. Themes we hear now in, 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 in more uh, contemporary uh, uh, discourse on inequality and its measurement. One more slide. One, once more. All right. So what does that mean? Um, this notion of liberty, which, which is is a good thing, uh, but this notion of the distribution of wealth, right? Well, it need not be equal. It should be to must be to everyone's advantage. And so, when we look at uh, these observed inequality statistics a little bit later in the talk, so. You know, behind uh, the notion of inequality, and I'm sort of presaging what we're, where we're going to end up, is uh, this notion of uniformity, right? And if we're talking about a population and the way in which they experience and enjoy, uh, get to partake in some good, um, the, the, the most sort of banal version of inequality is everybody gets the same thing, right? Um, is that the best thing for society? Is that utilitarian? Is that useful? Um, and, and Rawls answers that question by saying it need not be equal, but it must be sort of to everyone's advantage. And this is something we should think about when we start looking at the observations of inequality at a macroeconomic uh, level. All right, please, next slide. Want some more? All right, so, so Rawls is, 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 a, is a guide for constructing a society and a suggestion on how we should measure uh, uh, or value it. And so we'll just go forward one more slide. So the brief sort of aside into welfare economics, this is not a talk about welfare economics. The link between welfare economics and inequality is that each of these are measures uh, or, or, or ways of describing distributional behavior. And, and in fact, inequality is, is 
is only meaningful when we're talking about measuring quantities across distributions or populations. Uh, so we have the Malthusian perspective. Uh, some of you may be familiar with that. I remember being back in um, high school debate many years ago. And uh, if, you, if we weren't prepared for an argument, uh, and if, so this type of debate I did, you had positive, you have negative, you affirmed a resolution or you engaged it. Uh, one of the standard arguments we had uh, to, to negate any, any, any positive or affirmative argument was that <clears throat> it would uh, make more people and the world would be destroyed, the sort of Malthusian argument, right? A sort of desultory way of looking at the world. Um, go forward one more time. We have Ramsey, again, Ramsey, a contemporary of, 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 of Russell and some of the other people we'll see later on in this talk uh, <clears throat> with this notion of wealth uh, being problematic, ethically indefensible, a polite expression for rapacity, um, a mathematical theory of saving. So another one of these welfare economic guys that's sort of the opposite, if you will, of uh, the Malthusian take. But the, no the notion of distribution or distributional measurement is, is beneath his work. Uh, one more slide. And then we have Ho Hotelling, uh, an an another mathematician, statistician, economist, uh, and the quote I take from him, problems of exhaustible assets are peculiarly liable to become entangled with the infinite. And so now we've, we've, we've entered in beyond this uh, um, um, synchronous notion of inequality. Now we're talking about uh, measuring a sort of distributional quali quality or, or metric across time, right? This notion uh, of, of, of there being a time period and, and the time period here being infinite. And so all of these things uh, have to do with how we measure and assess a distributional quant quantity. Uh, and, and they're good sort of precursors for when we do start to look at how we do measure it and, and, and the, the trail uh, that we end up on. All right, please once more. So this is just, I throw in a couple slides here just to, to scare you some, some mathematical equations. These are just, translating uh, sort of the maxims that are written down, right, in narrative form um, by Malthus, Ramsey, and Rawls uh, in, in, into <laughs> equations on uh, uh, welfare functions. Um, we can skip these. But we can come back to them later if you'd like to talk about it. But, but what I'm trying to get at here is that, and these, this, this is like a cartoon sort of picture, right, for each of these different uh, notions of, of welfare functions, of for each of these different ways of maximizing how society uses its resources, uh, underlying it is consumption. And so what we're talking about is, is, is an apportionment of consumption. Now, that's a very important distinction to make. And this is something I hope we come back to later on in the discussion. When, when we talk about inequality and measuring it these days, again, we do, we do it in a sort of distribution way, talking about within a population, we can segment populations, but we talk about it within populations. Underneath this notion of equality, equality of wealth, equality of income is a sort of constant notion uh, or sort of a, a, an, an, an immutable notion of, of consumption, right? And so that's something else that, that I think that we should deal with in, in a mature discussion on inequality. Let's go forward one more time. All right, so measuring inequality, what does that look like? Let's go forward once more. So this is a little bit of statistics. Uh, I'll take you back to your, your undergraduate days. Uh, this is an illustration uh, of an empirical, i.e. Uh, just, just calculated straight from data, uh, distribution of income. This is the uh, consumer price index. I forget what the other uh, part of the acronym stands for. But this is a, a income statistics and it's, it's rather old. Uh, it's actually, this is a slide I've been using for a long time uh, back when I was doing theoretical research on this sort of stuff. But what we see here uh, on the left-hand side, you can't see my arrow, but on the lower left-hand side to the upper right-hand side is the space on which this curve, the cumulative distribution function lives. And this function is a function from a value. In this case, the value is the household's income to the share or probability uh, that any household has that value of income or less, right? Uh, Hit the, the, the arrow just one time, and I think this animation will start 
which should be illustrative. Uh, maybe not that one. Can you go back and hit, just hit the arrow? That should be an animation. Yeah, hit the like your right arrow key. Do you have a right arrow key? Try the right arrow once more. All right, there we are. Okay, so that, so that that this is the curve that you'll get the empirical distribution function or cumulative distribution function curve that you'll get if a society is completely egalitarian, meaning all of the income, everybody has the same amount. So what you see here in the lower green line is up until we get to the mean income, wherever that is, and I think in this case, it's like around 70,000 or something for a household. Um, up until you get to the mean income, no fraction of the households have less than that. When you hit the mean income, because we all have the same amount, we bump up to one, and that's the, the other part of this discontinuous curve, that green line at the top. Now, we've hit the mean income, all households. So any value uh, above that, the answer to do how many households have less than or equal to this, it's one. So this is what the curve looks like when you have distributional equality. Everybody has the same amount. And I'll hit the arrow one more time. All right, this is if <laughs> no one had anything, right? So the curve goes straight up uh, and, and right at zero or right, right to the right of zero. And we immediately get to the, uh, the complete fraction of the distribution. Uh, there's no income to a portion. Hit the curve, hit the arrow one more time. And this is what it looks like if only one person. So completely concentrated. Now I'm, I'm using the word for the first time, concentration. Uh, this notion of concentration measured on a distribution, right? Measured on a population. In this case, income is concentrated perfectly at one person. We move all the way up through the income uh, axis on the x-axis, that's the purple line at the bottom, until we get to the last person and that last person has everything. And then only then and only then do we reach uh, the fraction of, of, of the population that has income less than or equal to that value. And that's at that max value for the person who has it all. And so these are, this is what inequality looks like uh, when calculated via the cumulative distribution function. If we hit the arrow one more time. Oh, actually, to go back one second. There's one more thing I want to say. So I want to say this um, because it's important for, uh, for later. Uh, these data here, these, these, are, these are data that are, are, are binned. So from from this the these incomes you do not have the uh actual incomes of each of the underlying sort of taxpayers what you do are you have a series of of bins or categorized values and then you have the frequency and this is why this thing looks like a step function you have the the frequency or number of households uh that are fall within that value uh, so then you can calculate the share from number and then you have the total number of households and another thing I'll say that we'll come back to later is that this is truncated. Uh, this, these data are truncated. Uh, I can't remember if they're truncated. It might be 175,000 or something. Maybe it's 150,000. At any rate, past the truncation, so if you have 2 million or 3 million household income, it goes into this calculation and this statistic as if it were just in the last bin, which is 150,000. So that's something that's important uh, for later. And we'll talk about that. Uh, at the end of the talk. All right, please, one more slide. So from that graph, which is just basically how much, uh, how many people have how much, we can construct another version of the cumulative distribution function. It really is just, just the straight mapping from, from one way of seeing it to another uh, via this curve called the Lorenz curve. And so basically the Lorenz curve is you take the, the total cumulative distribution and you divide that by total income. So instead of the curve being over income and share, it's over share of population and share of income or good or wealth or whatever you're measuring. Uh, and so Lorenz, another one of these, these characters, late 1800s, middle 1900s, um, statistician, mathematician, also socially interested. Uh, I think he, this was his, his paper in 1906, it came out in the American Statistical Association. Uh, and he was interested in comparing tax records from two different periods to see if the income or equality 
uh, had, had, had grown or, or decreased. Now, this is his first graph of, of this curve that he defined. You'll see in later iterations of it, the thing is flipped around and the axis axes are put the other way. Uh, so instead of having a 45 degree line with a curve on top of it, you have a 45 degree line with a curve under it. Let me go to the next slide. All right, more math. This is just a <laughs> illustration that the, the distribution function, which says amount of good share of population is really the same thing as Lorenz curve, which is now share of population, share of good. And that's basically it. And I wave my hands. And these, are, these, are, these are exactly the same thing, just one is divided again. And go for one more slide. All right, so this, this is the Lorenz curve. On the same data that we just looked at, which is the uh, money income for households in 2008. Um, and I, I, you can, I'm gonna ask a couple of questions that, that I can answer uh, in, you know, in the course of the talk, meaning right now, but uh, we can come back to you later and talk more about the meaning of it. And one of these I presage. So if you go forward, forward hit, hit the arrow one more time, please. Just one quick more time. All right, okay. So. This is the little Lorenz curve for the same data. So we took that same sort of step by stuff here and we mapped it onto this curve by divi dividing again uh, by, the, by the population. And so if you see that green line in the middle, the green line going the 45 degree line, that's the curve that you get if everybody has the same thing, right? And in, in the, from the cumulative distribution, flat line up to the mean, bounces up to the total population and continues on in perpetuity. The 45 degree line in the Lorenz curve, same thing as that other curve. These other curves here that you see that start off at zero, zero and are bounded at one, one, which should go from share of the population to share of the good, give you a sense of how concentrated uh, the, the thing you're talking about or measuring is, how concentrated the wealth or the income is. If we are at this dotted line, it goes from zero, zero to zero, one, and then from uh, this would be zero, one up to one, one that dotted line that's sort of backwards L, that's the curve, Lorenz curve, for a completely concentrated uh, population where all of the resources are being held by one entity. And anything in between, between equality, the 45 degree line and that, that, that backwards L is something that's not fully concentrated, not fully equal. Same data. And so we can see here in this data here, I've calculated an additional statistic here, which is, the, which I'll just go ahead and say, which is the, the, the Gini coefficient. And the Gini coefficient is just a mapping of these curves. So from all of these curves that you could get, the infinite population of curves you can get between this line and this L, you can map each one to a number. That number you can scale so it ranges between zero and one. Zero meaning the line of, in, of, of equality, the green line, one meaning that backwards L. It's a measurement of how concentrated the income, wealth, whatever you're measuring is of the population. So we see here these observed, these are the observed estimates of uh, the Gini coefficient, right? The mapping of this Lorenz curve uh, for US when stratified by, you know, so-called race. So we see for all, for the entire US 2008 bin data, just don't forget that, uh, 37. So we're at 37%. You know, again, we can go from zero and one concentration. For whites, 36, black, 42, again, equal is zero. So what do you notice here? Well, uh, the black population is, 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 has wealth more concentrated. So uh, more wealth is held in less hands uh, than the white population. In between their average, obviously there are a lot less black people than white people because in this, in this sample, I'm just in general in this country, that's also true. Um, because the average of 36 and 42 isn't, uh, the unweighted average isn't, isn't 37, right? Um, the weighted average is, meaning that the number of people in, the, in that group are uh, a lot higher. All right, so let's move on. Gini coefficient. So uh, uh, another character, same period of time, a contemporary of Lorenz, uh, a contemporary of Russell, um, contemporary of Einstein, contemporary of, of, of Gumbel, uh, there were you know, contemporary of Hotelling, uh, um, similar mindsets, uh, also socially concerned. So Ginny's innovation was 
measure and rescale what I just said, uh, the Lorenz curve, so that you can map it to, to one number. And there's not the best picture of, of, of Corrado Gini, but the only one I could find. Um, <laughs> next slide, please. If we go to the next slide, are we still there? Hello? Can we go to one more slide? Did we lose somebody? Oh, there we are. Yep, more math. Uh, this is just Gini curve, Lorenz curve, same thing. One's a curve, function over share of population, one's a number. Um, next slide. <clears throat> this is something we'll come back to later. So one of the, 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 the nice things about the Gini coefficient uh, is that it's, it's a really illustrative, I mean, in, in general, I think people, uh, and this is not my area, but this is just a supposition, that people understand scalars better than they do uh, functions and vectors, right? I, a number, I can, I can believe, uh, a function, some curve, even though it may be more illustrative and give us more nuance, sort of harder to pick up. <laughs> the, the, the Lorenz curve that's moving uh, and animated at the top left is, is calculated from the same population that's giving us the, that scalar number, that Gini uh, coefficient on the bottom right. So it's the same information, but look at how much more illustrative of the change in concentration the Gini coefficient looks like when compared to the change in the Lorenz curve. All right. Uh, so yeah, this the animation here playing around with a uh, PowerPoint. So shift in the Lorenz curve <coughs> may look slight when, when real changes in the uh, Gini coefficient are significant. And then that's what this is, is leading up to saying. So you can hit the arrow one more time. All right, let's move to the next slide. All right. So observations. So now we've talked about sort of the, the precursors for, for, for measuring something across entire populations. There's this notion of fairness uh, and equity. Uh, there's this notion of instantaneity and uh, measuring things across the infinite. Now let's look at, at, at what, what, what goes on uh, sort of in the applied world and the zeitgeist where we take income or wealth statistics and we stick them into these equations and then we come up with numbers and we stand back and, and see what we have. All right, so let's move to the next one. So this is an illustration of the Lorenz curve, the calculated Gini coefficient, and then this, this bit here, which is the Lorenz curve at one half. And so it says Lorenz at one half equals 0 0.031. What does that mean? So if the Lorenz, cur Lorenz curve is the mapping from share of the population to share of the underlying good, wealth or income, the Lorenz curve at one half tells you how much half of the population has of this thing to be distributed. And so this worldwide, in this calculation, again, the, the data for this are about 10 years old, back when I was doing uh, academic research on this, this sort of stuff. Half of the population has only three hundredths of the entire wealth uh, on, on the planet. So that, that, that's a uh, um, 3%. You know that that's when calculated this way. Uh, what's the underlying calculation here? The underlying calculation here is an estimate of gross national product, but downscaled uh, to half a degree lat long. And so this is a heat map going across it. Uh, pink is uh, less income. Uh, the the darker red color is more income. You see, most of the world is relatively poor. When it's calculated this way, it's down to half degree lat longs, with a few places you know, of high income, and, and these are easy to pick out, right? The centers of commerce. All right, if we can go forward one slide. Same calculation, but done on administrative boundary. And you notice on administrative boundary, what happens is the, the concentration goes up, right? So when, when we're willing to, 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 to calculate uh, inequality uh, across national boundaries, right, on these little sort of that long boxes, it's, it's, it's shrunk a little bit. But when we agglomerate wealth into to nations, um, it even it, it further increases. Now, both of these are high concentrations, right? The other one was, was almost 0.8, this is 0.85. We're at the end of, 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 of the scale of, 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 of concentration. 
Um, and, and now the fraction again here has even decreased. So half of the world, uh, again, using country administrative boundaries, uh, 1% of the world. So, so not, a, not an egalitarian uh, uh, illustration of, of, of how wealth, income, gross natural product is distributed across the world. Next slide, please. So that was the world. Now let's look uh, and, and measure uh, inequality at each country and see how it compares across countries. So if we'll go to the next slide. So this is an illustration uh, of, of the, the concentration. So we're just taking concentration here on the y-axis and on the x-axis, it's uh, GDP. Now I took the log of GDP here <laughs> because, and as you just saw, uh, you know, the, the range uh, in, 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 in GDP and in GMP uh, is, is, is wide. And I take the log to sort of shrink that axis so that we can look at everything on one panel. But there's a, 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 there's a leagues of difference between Japan, say, at the lower right here, and, and Barbados, right? Uh, so we take the log so they can sort of be put uh, in a coherent way. And we're looking for a relationship between money and uh, inequality, right? Um, slight, you know, and, and, and one that's, that's, uh, that seems almost counterintuitive. Uh, again, all of these things are just observational. There's no underlying model. In fact, almost everything I'm showing you here has no underlying model other than to, to measure this distributional qu quantity, right? There's, there's no other statistical model going on than just the empirical measurements. But we see this curve, which is you know trying to capture uh, a pattern uh, between GDP and, and Gini. And then if anything, the curve is, is flat and, and decreasing as money uh, as, as GDP goes up. But you can see some things that are, are important. There's Brazil and that dot on the upper uh, right quadrant, lots of income, lots of inequality. Uh, Haiti on the upper left quad, quad, quadrant, uh, not much income, lots of inequality. And then there's United States. Um, not as much inequality as Brazil, but a fair amount, definitely above the, uh, the average or mean inequality at that level of income uh, and, and high income as well. All right, let's move to the next slide. All right, and we just have to click through these, uh, these little animations. So again, these are sort of, uh, each dot is a country, these axes are the, are the country's Gini coefficient score versus some other sort of metric. Uh, the Human Development Index is this first one. And again, we're looking for a relationship between the Human Development Index and this, and this Gini coefficient. If anything, uh, we see past the threshold, or really where all the data are grouped, uh, that the HDI um, increases when inequality goes down. That seems to match with something we might have in our head about uh, fairness and how people experience it. This next one, if you hit the arrow one more time. Uh, this, this is a measure of, um, of graft, the, 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 the share of economy that, that's unofficial, that not, you know, not on ledgers. And again, as, as the share goes up, inequality tends to go up as well. There's some places that stand out, Nigeria, Brazil. Uh, the United States gets good scores on uh, the officialization of the economy, but again, still high. Uh, in relative inequality. Um, and then this last one here, I have to move this thing out of the way, incarceration. So the, the incarceration rate for inequality, again, as when more people are incarcerated, places tend to be more unequal with respect to uh, um, income. And there's the United States again, another, uh, you know, I hesitate to say outlier because you know that's always, that's a loaded term, but far out on the uh, uh, incarceration uh, axis and, and relatively high in the uh, um, inequality measurement. All right, if you go to the next slide, please. All right, so now let's look at some things that are uh, within uh, the United States. If, if we'll click the next slide. <laughs> but this is a different measurement and, uh, and, uh, and, I, and we can talk about this. I, this is not part of the, the Gini setup, although it's um, similar to the Gini, the Gini measurement. It's another way of measuring inequality, but this, I, I kept this one in because I just thought it was uh, important. This alternate me way of measuring inequality shows you the contribution across all the different groups, right? So before, at the, each of the inequality, inequality measurements we had up till now were four sort of closed populations. Uh, and we were measuring inequality either across administrative regions or 
within a country. Now we're going to measure it within a country, but and these are all you know counties within a country, and it shows you the contribution, how much each region co contributes to the overall measurement of inequality. We know what the overall measurement is by Gini for this. We're somewhere. Uh, well, we looked at the the 2008 number. We're about you know, 0 0.37, 0 0.4. Um, it's likely higher now. Uh, and this again is an old our old data, but I just think this is interesting. So when you look at areas that contribute a lot to the the, the total inequality, and we can talk about more of this measurement sort of sort of voce. I just didn't want to go into the technical aspects here. I, you know, some places stand out: uh, New York City. Uh, Chicago, <laughs> Southern California, right? These are places that are contributing a lot to the overall economic quality, inequality. Um, I could make some jokes uh, about, about this, but maybe we'll make those in the Q&A. All right, please, next slide. Within the country, again, we, we, we see these sort of patterns. Uh, again, no other statistical model here than, than just taking the uh, official measurement uh, at the state level. Um, so we see inequality increasing here, uh, crime. It's hard to sort of pick something out, but we do see DC. It's very interesting. Uh, they're an outlier. DC, uh, and again, that's changed some over the last 10 years, but DC has, has, is, is relatively high uh, in uh, income inequality uh, in administrative regions in the, in the United States. <clears throat> but here at this point, you know, they had the violent crime was relatively low, although they also score poorly uh, in, in math and uh, high in infant mortality. So uh, these illustrations allow you to pick out places that are sort of pathological with respect to the overall sort of trend. All right, next slide, please. And th there should be a play button on this somewhere. If this is still in PowerPoint, like if you click on the graph, there's a play button. Yeah, there you are. I like to let this go. So this, <clears throat> this isn't, I forget where I got this, this graph from, but this is from data from work by uh, uh, Thomas Piketty and, and Emmanuel Saez on, on, on looking at uh, the distribution of income as it relates to tax rate for a very long time. So we looked at the inequality measurements, right? And, 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 and we had the sort of steady state sort of thing here. I just want to point out, if you let it play one more time, I just think this is just a, a beautiful illustration. Uh, it, look at the, the change in, in, in the top tax rate and, and really the top tax rate at the 99th percent of the distribution over time. And this is something I think we can talk about uh, in the Q&A section. Uh, not a measurement of inequality, right? But perhaps one of the determinants of it. We, you know, it's just a really beautiful in, in illustration uh, on, on what might be some of the drivers behind uh, the, the distribution of measurements we can take. If you go to the next slide, please. All right, <laughs> this is EPI. And this just came out, uh, th this illustration, I think just about a month or so ago. Again, not a measurement of inequality, but what you see here is the same distributional information on the x-axis for the for the tax rate <coughs> was the percentile of the distribution, right? So that would be the same axis on the Lorenz curve. The same thing here on the uh, the stratification of these different curves are different percentiles of the distribution, and we see the change in the in the wage rate uh, along with that. So these these are the things that we usually consume. Uh, the information stratified at, at some level, talking about the 99% or the 50% and stuff like that. Um, Piketty is, is, is fond of not describing uh, uh, inequality in, in sort of the either the Lorenz curve way or to use just a coefficient. I, and, and he said this, and I, and, I, and, I, and I tend to agree, he finds it more compelling to sort of talk about which you know fraction of the population owns which fraction of wealth and things like that to talk about in terms of deciles. People seem to understand that and the message gets through a lot better. If we can go on to the next slide. And then there's the, 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 the just a couple slides here. You know, we're all at home and not together. So it's, it's, it seemed to be remiss to, 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 to skip just a little uh, sort of observational illustration of, of inequality and, and coronavirus if you go to the next one. And so now we do let this run here for a second. Um, We'll have to pass through a couple of times to get to get the message. So we just let it sit 
and I'll just blab for a second. So on the y-axis is an excess mortality score, just a way of standardizing what the excess mortality has been from last year up till now uh, at each country. And on the x-axis is this inequality co coefficient, right? <clears throat> and then the, the number on the upper right quadrant is, 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 the, is, is, is a version of the correlation uh, across these entire collection of countries between the, uh, this inequality measurement and this excess mortality. And you'll notice what we're, we're, strata, what we're going through here are, the, each of the, are strata by age. So we start off with 15 through 64. Have, have, then we go from 65 to 74, and then we go to 75 to 84, and then we go to 85 plus. Back to 15, 64. The strongest relationship and change between uh, excess mortality and inequality, the strongest relationship between excess mortality uh, and inequality <laughs> is when we take the, the youngest age range, demographic age range, right? When we look at excess mortality uh, and it's the, the older strata, there's less of a relationship to it. But when we look at the younger ages, wow, there's a, there's a much stronger relationship. We're looking at a difference between 0.42 and then you know 0.5 and then even a negative one. And these are probably just this dysphoreous maybe. But this is the effect of, of, of so underlying it, you know, again, no statistical model. There are latent things, other ways of describing each of these things uh, in a proper way, in a modeling way to see what the effect of this is on that. But I think it's powerful that when you look at the, the younger strata and you look for a relationship between inequality and excess mor mortality, you find a stronger association. Uh, so, you know, that's something that, to chew on. All right, if we can go for one more slide. And then lastly, you know, I, some of this we can talk about uh, again in the Q and A, sort of more loosely. I did want to inc include a little bit, uh, sort of in, in, in the business world. You know, what's the business world? We're all, you know, working at different things. Uh, and 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 one of the nice things I, I'll say about uh, taking this job uh, at a music company is, is at the end of every day I stand back and I, and I say I'm just trying to get people to listen to music. <laughs> you know, it's a it, it's it's not a desultory thing. And it's consonant, I think, with a lot of the, the works that I, I've done and observations I've made on, on sort of distributional uh, inequality and fairness and stuff like that. If you can go forward one slide, please. So now we're back to, if you'll remember this slide, uh, it was uh, juxtaposed with a Lorenz curve. And the point that I was making the first time we saw it was that the Lorenz curve could shift a lot what would shift, you wouldn't be able to see uh, the real difference in what happened by just sort of eyeballing the shift. But when you look at it in terms of the, the mapping onto the Gini coefficient, you can see it very, very well. And here's where we see this. So this is a, is, is rescaled and it's, it's not the whole population. You know, this is all proprietary stuff. So this is a version of this data. But what you see here is concentration in a streaming market over time. Uh, this little bit in here in 2019, I'm not sure about the validity of the data, but what you see is concentration decreasing until about that point and then sort of taking off again. Um, what could this mean? What, is it, what does it mean for music to be concentrated? Well, this means that uh, more of the listening is happening in, you know, on fewer ears, right? Is that a good thing or is that a bad thing? Let's go to the next slide. Turns out that in these data, in these observations, when we look at the volume versus uh, the concentration, they happen in inverse relationships. So stepping again, there's no underlying model here, no other sort of latent sort of variables to explain any, anything, but this is sort of a, a sort of a bald a sort of statement, just looking at the, the directions of the two curves. It, it, when concentration decreases, listening overall goes up, but when concentration increases, listening seems to go down. So, from the music industry perspective, one of the things you'd want is there to be less concentration in the music market, right? You want more ears listening to more stuff, more uniformity in listening, not just a few ears listening to some stuff um, because volume and, and people listening to music is how the music companies make their money. But just something to notice. All right, then we can go to the next slide. So let's have the Q and A. And I just wanted to put up uh, the, the the themes from the beginning here. We want you know axioms, dependence, scarcity, uh, measurement versus obfuscation. That was that bit about 
how the CPI data are measured and binned and truncated, you know, and our ability to be able to assess uh, uh, inequality properly. Uh, and then to the right there is my sleeping child. I, I always like to put her at the end or beginning of each slide. It, it leavens things. All right, thank you. And love to hear your questions. Hi, thank you very much. That was, that was incredibly eye-opening. Um, uh, so we, we do have a few questions and I think we have about 10 minutes. Um, so uh, one question um, that came in from, um, I, I think, and I think that you've sort of have answered this, but, but not quite. Um, a question from um, John Tabori, who's actually, who's on the call. Um, has your view of inequality changed as a consequence of the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, particularly in light of the fault lines that the pandemic has exposed with respect to access to health care, housing, and job security? Right. No, that, that's fair. And I can, you know, so let me say that these are all outside of my, my ken. There's people who, who research, live, work, uh, contribute in this area that, that are more qualified to Think about these things and comment, opine on them than I am. Having said that, I you know if we go back to um, to Rawls's first sort of sort of maxim that 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 maybe we don't we can't maximize uh, a uniformity, i.e., we can't drive concentration down to zero, but we have to apportion resources uh, well, right? And then, and then a society that that that, that maximizes its wealth perfection is one that apportions resources properly. Um, you know, and this is just a comment any of us could make. I don't, I don't think any of us have, have been pleased by, you know, what appears to be a, a, a pathological operations behind uh, um, 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 sending out vaccines. Um, it's certainly a comment on, on, the, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the healthcare system, again, not my area, but one of the things that, that, I, that, 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 I, that I like to say, you know, and when talking about inequality, these distributional measurements is we're really all in it together, right? Um, I spent the first part of my career uh, doing environmental statistics, which was all about how to sort of reframe uh, and refactor consumption. Um, one of the things that I think is lost in, in, the, in, the, in the discussion about inequality is are we all just looking to consume more at an equal level, uh, or are we looking to consume less and apportion things sort of more more wisely? And I think, you know, this past year has, has illustrated to everyone um, that we have problems with the way in which we assign resources, um, and, and 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 we have problems with being able to act in a collective way. Uh, we're measured in a collective way, right? The spread of a disease it happens over a population in the same way that we measure inequality over a distribution. Whether you like it or not, uh, your fate is tied up uh, with people uh, in, in the same administrator group as you, in the same area as you. Um, whether you like it or not, these inequality measurements uh, have to do with how we push around wealth and income. And, and so I think that, you know, the important lessons and things to think about uh, when we think about how we've, we've realized all this stuff, I think uh, one of the, you know, and, I, and I'll just say this last part and just sort of riffing again, you know, there's people who do, who do health and, and stuff better than I do. But I, I you know, I, 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 again, I spent the first part of my career as an environmental statistician. Uh, I have been doing it since the 90s when I was an undergrad. And I remember uh, after the first Rio conference in 92, uh, there was this excitation about uh, how we were going to become more aware of the environment and, 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 and really sort of forestall climate change. And then we had this orgy of consumption uh, in, the, in the 90s, these large SUVs and all of that. Uh, one of the things I hope we get from this, you know, 10, 20, almost 30 years later is, is an understanding of, of sort of the limits uh, of consumption and the, this, this collective notion that, that we're all being measured in, in, together in, 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 in closed populations, whether we like it or not. Thank you. Um, do you have any views on how uh, people of color might be able to use these kinds of statistics uh, to their advantage? 
uh, in the workplace or otherwise. Sure. I, so again, I'll, with, with, I'll give the caveat that not my area. There's people who do this a lot better than me. I can uh, recommend you look at some of the papers by uh, William Darity or Derek Hamilton who do great work on inequality and wealth and then the way that it's, that it, that it's measured and, and sort of affects and burdens uh, people of color, black people. Um, but it, you know, just commenting on, on how can we use information to sort of uh, navigate, uh, you know, jobs and things like that. Um, so I'll tell you, and this, this, so let me ask, say this first thing, whatever, this has less to do with people of color than more than sort of how to understand sort of distribution of statistics and how, and, and how they affect. So I, I work for a media company and before this, I also worked for a media company. One of the things you're very interested in, in, uh, in, the, in at a media company is the audiences that consume your content. Um, and, 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 and when you get better at it, you learn it's not just the audience, that there's this notion of concentration in the way that an audience consumes your content. You want to be able to describe, target, and reach uh, a very sort of tightly grouped uh, uh, audience of people with a very sort of pointed uh, and nuanced message. Um, and so that, so that understanding then about how, how, how populations are stratified and how, and, and, and how to measure concentration is important uh, in that field because it's one of the metrics that, that sort of predicts success. Um, I hope that's useful. Um, I've, I'll, I'll ask you one more, which I, I, think, um, I think is closer to, to, to what you do if, if I'm following correctly. Um, so how can non-classic measures and data be used to change classic ways of gathering data and measuring impact that are increasingly seen as inappropriate for questions raised in recent protest actions related to inequality and poverty? Hmm. That's interesting. Let me, let's see if we can pull that apart yet. Um, is it, by way of introduction, let, you know, one of the things that's, uh, that people are noticing about uh, modeling populations and their behaviors are uh, some of the, the nuances or, or biases that may come up um, in measurement uh, because because of the presence of sort of latent variables of information that you don't account for, right? Um, this, and, and, and so people worried about the machine learning algorithms, for instance, facial recognition. Facial recognition algorithms have a, uh, a higher uh, uh, false positive rate uh, for people of color. That could happen for a bunch of different reasons. The faces might be different. The shading might be different. There are less people of color in databases. Uh, so, the, so the discovery rates are affected. Uh, I'm of the mind that 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 you do include as much information as you can in, in, in modeling, right? Like, I don't think it's a a racist thing to include in a model uh, for facial recognition uh, other covariates that may help you predict the face or, or in a credit model. Um, the problem is is that people think they they think including information means means it, it means imposing bias. But I, you know, as a statistician, I feel like it's, it's often the opposite. Uh, the ignorance or missingness of information actually increases bias, right? And it, it, may, it makes it harder for us to explain things. I, I think it's a different thing between uh, the legitimacy of doing something, uh, I, uh, meaning legitimacy with respect to sort of fairness and all that, uh, and, and the sort of utility of doing something. Um, and I think that a lot of people, and rightly so, have uh, questions and, and concerns about about governments, corporations, et cetera, doing things which you know have heretofore been illegitimate, uh, but may have a real utility, right? Uh, and so then this, you know, I, I'm finding my way back around to sort of answering the question about people of color. I mean, what can people of color do? Uh, you know, I'm, learn as much as possible. Um, be specific. You know, I started off doing statistics, I, I'll tell you, this is a colloquial sort of story. My dad was a, a psychologist and I remember when he was finishing his, uh, his dissertation, he had to get uh, someone to do his statistics. This is back in the seventies. And I remember him walking and, you know, going to someone's house, the statistician and paying him like $270 or something like that. And I remember like, what are statistics? You, you know, uh, learning and, 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 and being in the master of information uh, is crucial. Uh, for, for people of color, for any 
everybody. And I think especially for people of color who, who suffer historical disadvantage, um, um, being more diligent uh, about being on top of information and how to assess it uh, is more important. Yeah. Thank you. Um, uh, so I just wanna say thank you very much. That was incredibly eye-opening. And I, I, I love the concept of of being a master of data and a master of facts as, as a way to, to change what you see around you. Um, thank you very much for this presentation, Dr. Abayomi. Um, and I think I speak for everyone else when I say uh, I'm very grateful to have had you here this evening. Thank you. Um, and thank you to, uh, to all the alumni uh, here that have joined us this evening. Thank you for taking time out of your day to spend an hour with us. Um, I hope you will join us again. And if you have any suggestions or any ideas of other things that you would like to, to hear us uh, see a spotlight, um, please get in touch and uh, have a good evening and be well and stay well. Right. Good Thank night. You. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Thank you.